All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Patrick Baines, who is in Philadelphia. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm wonderful. Thanks, John. Excellent. And Patrick is from Nerdwise. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is what sales enablement should look like in 2021. So uh, let's start off, uh, Patrick, baselining this for the listeners and viewers. When you talk sales enablement, what do you mean by that? Um, well, it's basically what you can do to make your salespeople's jobs easier and to make them more effective. Um, and there's a lot that can go into that, but I think that's that's what it means. Mm. So, um, so what are some of the what are some of the things that have changed maybe that people aren't paying as much attention to as they should for sales enablement going forward? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I kind of see it from the opposite angle, not so much in terms of what's changed, but because um, there are a lot of, there are certainly a lot of, of things that have changed and I could address it from there. But in principle, there's so many things about sales that have not changed through mm -hmm. the years and that you know, there's all of these kind of disparate solutions out there uh, to uh, help people be more effective. And, and either they haven't made it to every industry or to every company or to every, indi every individual practitioner. So there's, there's still a big gap in terms of taking advantage of them. And even without getting into the technologies and, and a lot of the kind of modern practices, um, just with what's available today, salespeople uh, can work a lot smarter, get a lot more, you know, done with less. And, and so I think it's kind of about, instead of looking at what's changed first, looking at some of the things about sales, sales process uh, that are kind of consistent or that have been the same for 15 or 20 years. And I think that's where, and I guess I'm starting to get to, to I think it's maybe now I'm getting to, to your, your question, which is that um, there are parts of the process that people, not that they couldn't do anymore or shouldn't do anymore, but that they just don't have to anymore and that you can get better use of your time or your teams can get, you know, help your team get better use of their time. Um, just by, again, without even, I could go into the, some of the resources, sure. but just by looking at how you augment that process with different, um, you know, different resources, uh, you can use lists as an example, right? Right. Um, one of the things that you just touched on there, uh, so I agree with you, there's a lot of things that uh, are enduring that people should still be doing that are still effective, that perhaps, you know, people have either are not doing as effectively as they used to, or haven't paid as much attention to, because, uh, you know, we tend to go for the shiny new toys. Uh, what are what are some of the areas that you think people should focus on to make sure that they're doing all of the things that they should be doing um, and, and maintaining all of the kind of traditional things that work? Well, yeah. So, I mean, first is if you look at your process, look at areas that you can drive efficiency in the process. And I often look at the first four to five steps of any sales process in, in B2B, and they tend to be very similar, although they are uh, unique to a business in terms of who they're targeting and what, what those activities in, in practice look like, but the first four to five steps, you know, identifying who are those organizations, who are the companies that you are your ideal clients, who are the decision makers in those organizations, how you reach out and with what message, and then how you follow through on those, on those prospects to turn them into yeses, nos, you know, meetings, opportunities. Um, so I think I, I, I would start by looking at the process and saying to myself, okay, well, gosh, we're spending a whole lot of time you know, identifying or our team is just going on their own to identify who these target clients are. Why don't we in kind of one swoop um, identify who these, who are our, our ideal clients, right? And then have a, have a named list of accounts to work against. Even if it's in the hundreds or thousands, now my team doesn't have to spend two hours of their morning doing that research. And, and then you can take it a step further, right? Who are those decision makers? And then you can get into, okay, well, now that we know who, who those companies are, who those people are, the next step of the process is the outreach and how can we augment that time that people are spending in into those those sorts of things so i think that's where you start is looking at yeah. you know where your time is being spent where that where, what, what your process is and then what's the best way to again to back to the, the word sales enablement how can we enable our team to do that stuff just better faster stronger 
Yeah, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to pick up on, Patrick, that you uh, mentioned there. The first thing is uh, is a sales process in itself. Uh, I'm not sure that all companies review it on a regular enough basis. I mean, a lot of times people think, oh, great, we have our sales process, we're good to go, and that'll just stay where it is for the next number of years, and it doesn't take into account the changing buyer behavior that sales process should be a dynamic thing because you should be tweaking it all the time and figuring out what works. So I think that's a it's, that's a great point for people to take away is when is the last time you actually did an analysis of your sales process? Yeah. And I, I love, I, I can't remember where I got this from, but some sales consultant coach once said, you know, if, if you or a member of your team were asked, what is your sales process? Could they answer that question? Because I think a lot of times, people kind of know what it is or they have a sense of what it is and 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 but you know you lose track of it over time people morph into their own methodologies and and so yeah i agree with you um and and that's where a lot of sales enablement can actually help put meat on the bones of the process it can be that connective tissue between the pro, you know the the prospect discovery to the outreach and it can it can actually make sure that you're following a process and that you're you know measuring it and you know how effective it is yeah and, and i think the other thing there that uh, that you touched upon too is the fact that the you know a sales process yes it's a it's a series of of steps or stages but within each of those stages there are things that need to happen and not all of them need to be done by the salesperson themselves. There are things that they need to be done. But nowadays, as you said, you can augment, you can use other technologies, you can have uh, things that automatically happen during these stages. So it's a combination of both. And that's why it's so important to really be on top of your sales process. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that you you mentioned as well was the, the, the target customer. And I think that's another thing that if you ask people to say, who's your target customer? Yeah, they'll kind of be able to tell you, but how often is, is that revisited? How often is that fine tuned? And how, how disciplined is the organization in going after the target customer? Because let's face it, we all fall into that trap of, okay, well, they're not exactly our target customer, but they're sort of, you know, we could probably do this for them. And before you know it, you're getting distracted off into chasing business that either you're not going to win or you probably shouldn't win. Yeah, well, that it's a, it's a good point to bring up as well, because that is where enablement starts, is what is our go-to-market plan? Who, who are our, our, our ideal clients? And, and, and I think a lot of folks, even if they have it, in broad strokes, like we work with financial services companies and they could be, you know, this size and, and they kind of have an idea and it could be that, that, that even is sounding narrow. Well, I mean, what's, what, what markets are you guys going after? Is it the whole country? And of course you can't do all of that at one time. Um, and then if it is, uh, who's, who's the, who are those titles you're going after? And is it multiple decision makers in, in the organization? Because then if you, if you really truly understand not just who that client is down to their size, their location, their title, you may find that, again, starting there, that your process can benefit from a better, deeper understanding of who that ideal client is. So they don't all care about the same things. And not many business, businesses are built off of just one, one vertical. So you know, understanding the, the different types of customer, ideal customer profiles, and then drilling into, okay, well, if I'm the CFO, I care about a set of things here that are different than the CEO. Um, and then if I'm in healthcare, I mean, I don't even use the same language as financial services anymore, right? I, now I care about patients. And if I'm in financial services, I don't use the word sales. I talk about clients. And, and, and so you can start to get a better sense of what should my messaging be? Where should I reach out to these folks? Um, but you, and then to provide that sales enablement, it really has to start with who is that ideal client so you can not be enabling your team to, to use the wrong <laughs> language or the wrong medium or whatever the case is, or a sub suboptimal set of those things. Um, so it, as, in regards to sales enablement and what it means in 2021 and beyond, um, again, kind of going back to the old, but still, still for the new is you, you do have to have a really good sense of who your target client is, the language they use, 
um, the outcomes that they are working towards that they care about, and then credibility, you know, like what, what matters to them in the, in the vendors that they work with and the partners that they partner with. Um, so you, that, that, is, that is a key place to start to have an effective sales enablement program. No, absolutely. I mean, you have to you have to resonate with them. You have to have some understanding of business in general, but as well as the business of your target customer, so that you can have those kind of value creating uh, and peer to peer conversations, if you like. Right. And that's uh, and obviously, if you are gone too broad, uh, that's very difficult to do. Yeah, people don't just want an expert in what you do; they want someone who understands their business as well. And you'll have an easier time generating leads, closing opportunities and delighting customers when you're in their clubhouse speaking their language and, and, and that you're bringing some of that value to the table. Now, we all know that in, in, in reality, that doesn't always matter on the solutions mm -hmm. and the implementation side, but it matters a lot in the psychology of the buyer and in how we engage them and how we bring them through our process. And of course, that does affect customer experience uh because that's that's step one but um yeah you have to you, you have to know your customer and know what they care about yeah and one of the other things patrick is obviously today is there are different groups involved right i mean once upon a time it was you know this the the, the marketing people would do their bit and then throw it over the wall and the sales people would run with it and whatever nowadays there tends to be a lot more people involved during the selling and buying process and different groups involved in it how do you make sure that how do you help people make sure that uh, all of that can be done in sync and it can all, all contribute towards sales enablement as opposed to being kind of you know random and disorganized um, it's, it's a good question. It's a little bit of a tricky question, but I think there's two, there's two categories for the answer, two buckets. And I think the most important one is around sales effectiveness. And that comes down to coaching and training and how we handle opportunities and once they're created. Right. And, and so if, you know, who asking the right questions, um, having the right, uh, uh follow-up steps in place, making sure that you're communicating to the right folks and that you know who that decision maker is. So I think sales effectiveness is probably the main solution there. Um, on, the, on the opportunity creation side, again, knowing who your ideal customer is, you'll never be an effective lead generating salesperson if you're going broad, as you said, right? You can't be effective in that way. So yes, while many people can get brought into the decision, it, if you're reaching out to you know, for every one person that it actually fits, your, that is the decision maker, if you're reaching out to five, well, you're going to be 20% as effective as a salesperson that's reaching out to five out of five or 100% actual decision makers. Because if I'm not a decision maker, yeah, I might influence it. Yeah, I might forward it on. Yes, I could make the intro. That's fine. And yes, opportunities can be created that way. Um, but just it's a numbers game and you want your numbers to be quality numbers as well. And so um, I think that both are certainly influenced in terms of like how you optimize, you know, engaging all parties. But uh, I would just say in two in, in two phrases, like don't reach out to people that aren't decision makers because you're spinning your wheels. And then when you have opportunities, you know, make sure that you're, you're you're managing those opportunities and communicating appropriately. You know, mess does little things right, like email the decision makers, CC the influencers. You know, call out the decision maker in your process, have them be the one that is your point person for next steps. Ask the question, hey, are you the one who's going to be making this decision? Uh, you know, no, just just manage that, 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 that correctly. And uh, I think that's the I think that's the best answer I can give on that one. Yeah. And one thing that you touched upon there a few minutes ago is that the customer experience. And I think that's a, a, a key uh, element today because. There's so many touch points uh, a prospect can go through as they go through the process of being a prospect and becoming a customer. And whether you're using a combination of technology and people, whatever, you have to create a kind of uniform experience for them, at least so that they it's a consistent experience. I guess that's what I'm saying there. So that raises its own challenges. Expectations. You know, it, it, so ex you, could, you could experience, yes, and expectations. They're set during the sales process. And if I think I'm, you know, buying a racehorse and I get a mule, I'm going to be, I'm going to be pretty upset. But if you tell me I'm buying a mule and I get a racehorse, 
you know, I mean, now we're, we, we, we can exceed expectations later on. So those two, those two worlds have to work together. And again, you know, salespeople need to be well trained and effective and manage customer expectations to create a great customer experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it more in my early years, just as much as anybody, but um, you know, where you sell hopes and dreams and, and, you know, you can't deliver and that's, that's going to be a problem for any business, you know, that you're, again, you're spinning your, your wheels, wasting cycles. And that's uh, not, it's not even, yes, you might get some short-term satisfaction uh, or short hit a, hit a number in the short run, but in the long run, you can't rebuild your reputation and you, you, you don't get the momentum that you get when you do deliver. So yeah, uh, expectations are huge. Uh, and another another key element today is I, I think this was happening pre pandemic anyway. I think there was a, a trend where prospects and, and customers were looking for more connection, more authentic, you know, an authentic connection to more authenticity from the companies or people they were interacting with. And I think that got accelerated during the, the, the pandemic for, for obvious reasons. But I think it's a really key thing today is people are looking for authenticity and, and connection. And so therefore, you have that challenge of you need to create that authenticity and that connection. But at the same time, you have tools and everything available to you to make everything more efficient and a better experience for the customer. So you also have to hit that balancing act, too. You, well, you hope you hope that you're using those tools in the right way. I think <laughs> that's the tipping point where people are losing authenticity. And, and um, you know, it's great to augment your sales process with some technology and to uh, hit, hit greater numbers and to be more effective. But when it comes to building relationships, you got to be polite, you got to be personal and you really have to get to know people and, and, and ask questions and build rapport and, and a relationship almost, you know, in the first 30 seconds of a call. And, yeah. and, you know, authenticity is, is great in wherever it comes into play, but if you skip over manners you know, and, and some of the basics and, and hi, you know, how are you? It's still a good time to speak for a few minutes. Thank you so much for making time to speak with me. That's authentic. And that's polite. It's a language people understand, and it opens up the door for a relationship. And I think those, again, technologies are great, but nothing is going to be authentic. Nothing's going to replace your authentic self and nothing can get you there better than uh, some good old fashioned etiquette and manners and all the things our moms taught us as kids. Uh, I think that's a great point, Patrick, because I do think people overlook the power of that uh, or they get for forgetful because we've become such a a casual culture, or at least that's what's projected out there that it's, it's and it's cool to be really offhand and kind of casual about everything. But to your point, if you are if you are polite and thoughtful and, and you engage, you'll actually stand. The sad thing is you will stand out today. You will stand out. Yeah, no, I, I, it's it's uh, it's sad, sad, but true. And just back to basics, you know, and, and, and basics from third grade, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah. I mean, because to your point, I mean, we've seen them, uh, especially during the, the, the pandemic and stuff, we've seen like LinkedIn just got like, some people just went crazy on LinkedIn using it as their their latest spam platform. Uh, I know LinkedIn is cracking down on that. But to your point, I think that's and that really undermines you, especially like when you get a connection request on LinkedIn and they've taken the time to personalize it and all of that, um, and you click on it because you think that's great. But then instead of instead of an authentic follow-up, you just get ping, you get their automated one with their sales pitch in it. And then you're thinking, okay, so you weren't actually making the effort. You weren't being authentic. You were just trying to get me. You were clickbaiting me. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I, I, one of my favorite sayings in sales, and I think it applies to uh, any medium is you know, how do you catch a cat? You know how to catch a cat, John? Um, I have two of them and I still couldn't tell you how to catch them. You, you, you <laughs> let it come to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's true of, of sales as well. And like, yes, you have to be courteous and take people through the process and sure you can manage it and all that, but it, people aren't attracted to you know, you getting in their face and trying to grab their attention and all of that stuff, you have to play it cool. And you, and you, and you, you know, whether that's your first, whether it's a message or, uh, I mean, I guess we'll just use messaging as the main one, like, don't be that guy, 
be be the cool cat you know hey i give them a compliment stay stay away you know i have i have a client who just told me that they have their admin go and add you know all the marketing qualified leads on on linkedin as connections and then they wait 30 days and then they do a courteous you know hey i just wanted to say you know thanks for connecting and then they do a, fo- a polite follow up uh, asking for a meeting and they have, you know, they, you get a one, 1% hit ratio on that and you're doing pretty good, but you're still being yeah. cool about it. You know, uh, 30 days, yeah. is a lot of time to have caught some content or to have a little bit more comfort and be a little less turned off when somebody reaches out to you for an ask. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a great analogy about the cat too. I love that one. I must remember that one because yeah. Um, whenever I try to get our cats to, when we've got to go to the vet, that's a whole, that's a whole other story that I should video it because it's quite comical. But anyway. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, Patrick, this has been fantastic. All of Patrick's information is going to be below this video with the links, et cetera. But before we go, please do tell people more about you and Nerdwise. Well, sure. So um, Nerdwise, we consider ourselves to be the best all-in-one sales enablement solution. And the, the, the way that I would break that down is that a lot of times you just get the tool and then you need the strategy, then you need the messaging, then you need the list, then you need the next thing or the next thing. We, we supply all of that to our clients um, and kind of not just hold their hand, but, but really drive the car while they sit shotgun and make sure that there's nothing that gets in our way. Um, so whether it be the technology that you need, the planning, the support, the execution, um, that's what we do. And so, uh, again, thanks for having me, John, and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah, listen, thanks, Patrick, again. Thank you all for watching and listening, and I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.